Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're with us today. If you'd like to know more information about Abundant Life, please visit AbundantLifeChapel.ca and you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram for more information. Uh, special thanks to everybody who has been supporting us financially. We appreciate every gift and giver. And if you'd like to continue to do so, please download the app Tithely and you can also give through our webpage at AbundantLifeChapel.ca. I hope this message will inspire you and build your faith. Welcome to church, and I just want to wish my mom a happy Mother's Day, and a happy Mother's Day to all the other moms out there. Please join us in some worship. Take heart. 
Happy Mother's Day. If this is the first time that you're tuning in to Abundant Life Chapel online, we want to welcome you to church. Since Easter weekend, I've been preaching a series of messages focusing in on specific individuals who have witnessed Jesus' resurrection. Over the last four weeks, we've looked at Peter and how Jesus made all things new in his life. Next, we looked at Thomas and talked about how seeing is believing. Then we moved on to a couple of Jesus' followers who were on a road trip to Emmaus, but they had reduced visibility. Last week, we looked at Mary Magdalene's story. Before I introduce who we're going to be spotlighting today, I want to give a special tribute to all the moms out there. Happy Mother's Day. Here's a cute little poem written by a mom. Some may climb Mount Everest in search of thrills galore, but I scale peaks that rival it just past the laundry room door. Slopes of socks and underwear, sheer cliffs of shirts and pants. Oh, yes, I live in mortal fear of a laundry avalanche. Moms are amazing. They seem to have superpowers like none other. Like who else can heal a mortal wound, a.k.a. a boo-boo, with a, just a mere kiss or a cuddle? And who else uh, knows exactly where you put your toy or your socks or your wallet or keys or backpack or even homework for that matter without even looking? Well, who else uh, knows what you did when you did it, and who you did it with, and when it happened, without even spilling the beans and you uttering a word, mom does. It's like they have this telepathy going on, some sort of sixth sense. And it must be true that every mom comes equipped with eyes in the back of their head because they know exactly what child hit who first in the back seat of any automobile. And there's no other human being who can seem to juggle on many tasks all at once like mom can. I've heard it said that a man may be the head of the household, but it's the mom who is the neck, the shoulders, the arms, the hands, the legs, the fingers, feet, and toes. And I'm convinced 100% that moms get their super uh, human strength from coffee and chocolate. 
Not only do they have superpowers, but they also seem to speak the same language. Have you noticed that? It's like that was built right into their DNA. Has your mom ever used any of the following uh, phrases? If you keep making that face, it'll freeze that way. Quit or quiet down. I can't even hear myself think. One day you'll thank me because I said so. That's why. As long as you're under my roof, it's my rules. If all of your friends jumped off a cliff, would, you, would that mean that you would also? Oh, so so-and-so's mom uh, lets her do so-and-such or such-and-such? Well, then go ahead. Live with them. I'll pack your bags. And let's all play a game, shall we? The quiet game. I'm not asking. I'm telling. When you have kids, I hope they're just like you. And don't you use that tone with me, Mr. or Missy. You better wipe that look off your face. And don't make me tell you again. Come back there or turn this car around. <laughs> Mothers, they share so many of the same qualities as well, uh, such as uh, inquisitiveness, tenderness, sympathy, compassion, and most of all, a mother's intuition. There are a few things more powerful than the tears of and prayers of a mother. There are few things that are more tender than a mother's hug or a compassionate touch. And interestingly enough, it has been said that out of the 69 kings of France, only three of them were really loved by their subjects. And you know what all three of those had in common? They were the only ones reared by their mom instead of a tutor or guardian. Napoleon may have been on to something when he said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Moms and all women in general, they are amazing creations. They are truly a gift from God. And today we're going to look at a high-profile mom in the Bible. Her name is Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. A few years ago, back in 2018, when we were all allowed to gather together uh, and not do social distancing, we did something fun for our annual community Christmas program. We did a talk show called The Hannah Show, and one of the people interviewed was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay, so it wasn't really actually Mary, but rather someone doing a wonderful portrayal of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so today we're going to turn back time and we're going to watch that interview to set the mood our worship team will perform for you today. Uh, Mary, did you know? I hope you enjoy it. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you?
And our next guest is what Humble is all about. Let's welcome Mary, the mother of Jesus. So, <clears throat> let me get this straight, okay? You found out you were pregnant before you got married. You traveled on a donkey. Mm -hmm. Well, you were nine months pregnant. Yes. And you gave birth to your first baby in a barn. And yeah. you mamas thought you had it bad. <laughs> My goodness. So, Mary, can you tell me a little bit about BC before Christ? Yes. You know, I was just an ordinary little Jewish girl, and uh, I grew up in a humble home in a small town. And uh, I was taught all the Jewish customs and traditions, and from all the accounts of our ancestors. We were a very God-centered family, because we're from the line of David. And the biggest thing that we learned growing up was that the Messiah would come and that it would come through the line of David, a baby would be conceived by a virgin and bear the name of Jesus. And wow. so we grew up believing that and knowing that. Hmm. So um, how, how were you chosen? Well, one day an angel appeared to me. His name was Gabriel and I was terrified. <laughs> not every day an angel shows up. <laughs> so um, he told me that I was chosen, that God found favor with me, Mary. Who knew? But he calmed my fears because he told me that I would conceive this baby and I should call him Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And I think I was maybe chosen because I always believed that God would do exactly what he says he will do. Yeah, wow, and, and he did. So can you tell us a little bit about this baby? Oh, this was a perfect baby. <laughs> I know all mothers think that, but, but this was a perfect baby. Totally. And you know, by the time he was two, it was our Jewish custom to take him to the temple. And we took him to the temple to have him consecrated by God. And Simeon, a wise religious devout man, was there. And he greeted us. And he took Jesus. And he had been waiting all his life to see the Messiah. And he proclaimed to God that this was the Messiah. Mm. It was just totally awesome. <laughs> but then he turned to me after he praised God for our baby. And he turned to me and he told me that Jesus would see the rise and fall of many in Israel. And that it would be a treacherous time for him and for us, for me, that a sword will pierce my own soul. And it troubled me. It really did. Wow. So I just want to point out, you said 
perfect baby. Oh, yeah. So, does that mean you are a perfect mother, right? <laughs> oh, no. Let me tell you about the day I lost Jesus. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> and it wasn't in a grocery store. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we had been to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover when Jesus was 12. And uh, we were traveling home on a long journey with friends and family. And at the end of the day, we realized Jesus wasn't with us. Well, you can imagine the panic. Joseph and I hurried back to Jerusalem and we searched high and low everywhere. And we found him in a temple talking to the elders. And I said to him, Jesus, I've been so worried. We didn't know where you were. And he just looked at me and he calmly said, Mother, you should have known I would have been in, in my father's house. I didn't understand that, but he was very obedient. He just came home with us and, and you know, he was just such a good child. So, um, you didn't understand that Jesus was the Son of God or? Well, yes and no. There were times where you get busy and you just think about all the, the things you have to do and, and he's part of the family and he's just, he's always good. He never did anything wrong. And uh, it really wasn't until I heard about his baptism by his second cousin, John the Baptist. Maybe you've heard of him. Yes. Uh, Jesus, when he was baptized, he went into the water and when he came out, a dove ascended from heaven and a voice said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, we all knew. Everybody that was there knew that indeed this was the son of Jesus, son of God. And you know, as a mom, and you moms will know, you just want to see your children grow up and be happy and healthy and prosper and have uh, a nice life and bring a wife home and bring those grandbabies home. And well, I knew Jesus wasn't going to be like that. I knew. I knew he had to go one day and do his father's will. And I just had no idea that he would suffer, that he was gonna suffer as much as he would. Wait, wait, okay, <clears throat> hold on. What, what do you mean, this, this is Christmas, like we're supposed to be talking about the baby in the manger. <laughs> we're kinda getting sidetracked here. Well, that's only half the story. You see, um, Jesus left when he was about 30. And as a mom, I knew, I just knew that it wasn't gonna be easy for him. And I couldn't stop him. He had to do his father's will. The most important thing I could do was pray. And so I prayed every day for him. And wherever he went, and he taught, and he did miracles, and he healed people, People loved him. They gathered around him. They even had a parade for him. They called him King of the Jews. People loved him, but the more they loved him, the more his enemies hated him and they plotted to get rid of him. And so one night he was arrested and they took him, the Pharisees and the chief priests, they took him and they beat him and they stripped him of his clothes and they put a crown of thorns on his head. And they made him stand before Pilate, who was in charge of the land at that time. And they wanted Pilate to condemn him. But Pilate wanted no part of it. He could find no wrong in Jesus. Jesus had never sinned. But the Jews are people. Jesus is people. They wanted blood and they were determined to get it. And so they bartered. They told Pilate, then free someone else and let us have Jesus in his place. So Pilate, he let Barabbas, a murderer, go. And the Jews had what they wanted. And so they marched Jesus to Golgotha and there, there, the soldiers, they drove spikes into his hands and to his feet. 
that they put him on the cross. And it was just more than I could bear to watch my son, who had done nothing wrong, crucified. And from the sixth to the ninth hour, it got so dark. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then at the ninth hour, he cried and he said, it is finished. It is finished. And he hung his head. And he was gone. He died. And my heart broke. I knew he suffered no more. But my son was gone. So I he was gone? Just Oh no, not for long. No, he was not gone. They could not keep him down. Oh no. God had a plan. And a good friend of ours took his body and wrapped it in cloth and put him in a grave and put a stone. But those Pharisees <laughs> those silly Pharisees. They were afraid that Jesus' friends would steal his body just because Jesus had said he would rise again in three days and they wanted to make my son, Jesus, look like a fraud. Well, they set guards up and they guarded that tomb as their life depended on it. Well, after the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and another Mary, it's a common name, they went to the tomb because as Jewish custom, we anoint the body with oil. And so they got to the tomb and the earth shook and there was an angel and the stone was rolled away. And the two Marys were terrified as I was when I first saw Gabriel. And he said, do not be afraid. He is not here. The one you seek is gone. And they looked in the tomb, and Jesus was gone. Just the clothes were there. And he said, go. Go tell the others to meet Jesus in Galilee. He is risen. He is risen from the dead, just as he said. And so they started to leave the garden, and Jesus appeared before them and said, yes, I have risen. I sit at the right hand of my father, but go tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. So the two Marys, they came and they told us all. And we went to Galilee and we saw Jesus. We saw him again. He had risen just like he said he would. And you know, when I leave this earthly place, I will go and see my Jesus again. My son, I will see him again. Wow. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for coming out. Um, that's all we have time for um, today for you. Oh, thank but you for having me. Oh, thank God you so bless much. you. I hope you enjoyed that today. Thank you, Hannah, Julie, and worship team for that powerful presentation. As we wrap up today, I want to read some scripture from Luke's gospel and share a couple of thoughts with you. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, it says this, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, and a, a, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to hear or went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel of the Lord said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. 
and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked. The angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. I am the Lord's servant. And as a servant of the Lord, she, Mary, was ridiculed and put to shame because of being pregnant out of wedlock. During the ninth month of her pregnancy, her and Joseph had to make the long journey to Bethlehem only to give birth to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the Messiah and Savior to all the world in a dirty, unsanitary stable. Her family was uprooted quickly after that and, and to escape to a foreign country in order to spare Jesus being killed by a, uh, in a child genocide conducted by King Herod. Mary and her family had to stand by from a distance as Jesus took his ministry on the road, and he considered his disciples more his family than his own family. Mary witnessed firsthand the false as, uh, accusations and insults directed towards Jesus. She witnessed him being falsely accused, then beaten, and then put to death by a grueling crucifixion. She watched him be buried in a borrowed tomb. But she also witnessed the res his resurrection from the dead. She saw him ascend into heaven. And she was one of the ones who was in the upper room, praying eagerly, awaiting the promised Holy Spirit of God. Listen to this in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They were all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women uh, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. You see, Mary was truly a remarkable woman. Why? Because she was the Lord's servant. I believe we have in our midst truly remarkable women who go above and beyond selflessly giving of themselves and uh, for others, whether they are mothers or not. And today, it's important for us to acknowledge them and to honor them. But most of all, show our gratitude and our praise to God for placing these wonderful women in our lives. In closing, I want to share this touching, uh, touching true story that happened during the Holocaust of the Second World War. It's about the complete dedication and sacrificial love of a mom. During the Second World War, Solomon uh, Rosenberg, his wife, and their two sons were arrested together with his mom and father, for the crime of being a Jew. They were placed in a Nazi concentration camp. It was a labor camp, and the rules were very simple. As long as you could do your work, you would be permitted to live. When you became too weak to do your work, then you will be exterminated. Those were the rules. Rosenberg watched his mother and his father being marched off to their deaths as they became too weak for work. He knew that the next in line would be his youngest son, David, because he was a frail child and wasn't able to keep up on his own. 
Every evening, Rosenberg came back into the barracks after hours of hard labor and searched for the faces of his family. When he found them, he would huddle them together and embrace, they would embrace one another and thank God for another day of living. One day, however, Rosenberg came back and he didn't see those familiar faces. He finally found his oldest, uh, his oldest son, Joshua, in a corner, huddled and weeping and praying. He said, Josh, Tell me it's not true. Tell me they're just not back yet. Joshua turned and said, Dad, it's true. Today David was not strong enough to, to do his work, so they, they came for him, Dad. But where is your mother? Asked Mr. Rosenberg. Where's Mom? Oh, Dad. <laughs> I'm sorry. When they came for David, he was so afraid and he was crying out. And, and so mom said, there's nothing to be afraid of, son. And so she went and she took his hand and went with him. That there is a mother's love. See, it's so strong that she would do anything for her children, even willingly sacrifice her life to comfort her child. There's something very special about a mother's bond with her child. And Mary, Jesus' earthly mother, is no different. She was truly the Lord's servant right to the end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this message. I thank you, Lord, that we can learn from the stories and testimonies of those that have gone before us. I thank you for Mary's story. Lord, she did some incredible things. She endured some incredible things. But Father, she was just as normal as, and, and as human and ordinary as the rest of us. But what set her apart to do these things is that she was the Lord's servant. And so, Father, I pray that that would be all of our prayers, not just for our moms today, but for, for dads and for children and for men and women, boys and girls. Lord, that we would be the Lord's servant, willing to do whatever it takes. And so, God, I pray a special blessing on all of those today, all those moms. I thank you. All those women. I think of especially those that can't have children or don't have children. Lord, today, for them just being a woman, today, Lord, we want to honor them. Father, I think of those who, maybe Mother's Day is a hard one to process. Lord, I think of myself and, and my wife and others who have lost moms already. And so God, today is, is sometimes just a, just a hurtful reminder that they're no longer here. God, I pray for them today. Lord, I pray for those that maybe moms that have lost children, whether they're, they're wayward or, or whether they've gone and passed on. Lord, I pray for them today. God, I pray for those especially who have maybe had an abusive mom or an abusive parent in their life. And so Mother's Day is, is, is just brings up all of these hurtful emotions. God, I pray for them today. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that, Father, you are the perfect parent. And, Lord, you can be a mom to us and a father to us. You can be all things to us. And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you today for people that you've placed in our lives that have shown us. Maybe that not our real moms, Lord, because what, regardless of the situation, but, Lord, you've placed spiritual moms in our, our, our presence. Thank you for those. We give this all to you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. You can catch us next week. Same time, same YouTube channel. God bless everyone. Happy Mother's Day.